Wow, um, I can't uh, thank you all enough. So I'm really excited to teach the devotionals this morning from the life of, life of Jesus, our 12th segment in this uh, process. And I thought as we continue to find themes to put these devotional thoughts around, that the themes this morning would be some sayings from Jesus that are outside of the Gospels. Now, most of the time when people think about Jesus and what he taught or what he had to say, they think about what we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we have a number of very substantial things that Jesus said that are found outside of those four Gospels. Some are found in the book of Acts. But that's not where we're going today. Today we're going to go to what Jesus said. Ah, let's see. Is my remote control not working? No, my remote control. That worked. Did you do that or did I do that? You did that? Oh, that's going to make this very eventful. Okay, I don't understand why. The remote is working on my computer, if that makes a difference. It's just not working back there for yours. So if you will check. The connections, man. <laughs> nah, we got nothing. They're going to work on it. While they work on it, would you advance the slide for me, please? We're going to go to the island of Patmos, where John was uh, exiled. And we're in the early 90s A.D. And Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos. And he had a number of things to say. So we're going to talk about those and we're going to focus in on three of them specifically. It's working. Thank you. Whoever did the Richard, thank you. He uh, Three things in particular. One, we're going to talk about fear. The second, we're going to talk about Jesus. And then third, we're going to talk about the heart. The heart of the matter and what really counts here. So that's our roadmap. Let's start with fear. Here's your passage for fear. Revelation 1, 17 and 18 says, But when I saw him, and the him here is Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Now here's my question for you. What do you fear? What is it when I just say that word fear that, that comes across your brain? Young people. Sometimes you fear what goes bump in the night. Actually, old people. You might fear what goes bump in the night, too. I represented a fellow one time who had uh, um, been driving a, a, a huge piece of equipment that's used in getting the, the grade right before you pave a street. And the way the equipment was made, it was made where the front wheels could lock up. So he's driving about 20 or 25 miles an hour and the front wheels locked up and it caused it to buck up and down and it fractured his back in the low spine and paralyzed him from the rib cage down. Uh, he, he didn't even have muscle control to be able to go to the bathroom. Um, uh, it was a terrible, terrible case. So he's, he's paralyzed from the rib cage down. He's from San Antonio and I had him on the stand and I said, what's the worst part of your injuries? And he talked about the, the, some, some different things that I don't need to say right here, right now, that were tough. But, but one of the things that was really big to him was he would sleep with a baseball bat because he was afraid someone would break in in the night to come after his wife. And because he couldn't move, he would not be able to defend her. So he had told his wife to stay real close to him in the bed and he had the baseball bat and to get to her they'd have to come to him and he could hit him with the bat because he could move his arms. 
That was a real fear he had. So I don't mean to make light of these fears. There are genuine things that scare us. And it might just be as a kid, you know, you're scared in the night, but there may be someone out there that gives you reason to be fearful. It doesn't always have to be a physical fear, though. Sometimes in this world, we're just dodging everything that seems to be coming at us. And, 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 and we don't know what's in front of us. You may have a business life where you're wondering what sharks are swimming down the road up ahead. You may have a world or a life where at home or at work or, or at school or at play or wherever you are, you feel like you get the brunt of everything. You're unfairly accused. You feel like in a, 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 your job is one where you just never know what's going to happen. To all of those circumstances and whatever you can answer that question is, what do you fear? I want to tell you again what Jesus said to John. He said, fear not. Those are famous words from Jesus. Jesus was having to tell his apostles that all the time. Jesus, when he walked on water and they were scared to death, they thought he was a ghost or an apparition, he said, fear not. Those words are words that Jesus had often said to his followers, but there's something particular about them this time as he's talking from the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos is where, as I told you, John has been sent in exile. The Roman authorities have exiled him to Patmos because John was continuing to teach the gospel. Church history tells us from Ephesus, which was the center of the, the wheel. It, 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 all the spokes went out from Ephesus. In that It was kind of like the Lubbock of its day, where everything just seemed to radiate out from there. The Isle of Patmos, you can still visit it today. You can see Turkey on a clear day in the distance. But one of, of the things about this is it was different for John to hear this from Jesus on the island of Patmos. I mean, John could remember when Jesus did the triumphal entry into Jerusalem a week, the Sunday before the crucifixion, Palm Sunday. Jesus came in, and, and as he was coming in, he told the people, Fear not, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. John wrote that in his gospel, probably just a few years within this revelation, is when John wrote his gospel. This is something that John's had in his brain for five plus decades at that point in time. As an old man, it was still there in his brain. Jesus saying, fear not. And the quotation that Jesus has from Zechariah 9.9 is a quotation that references a very specific cultural concept. When a king would enter a city, if the king entered the city and the city had been at war with the king and it was a victorious war entry, the king came in on his war stallion. But when the city submitted to the king without fighting, the king would ride in as a peaceful king and that would be shown not by what riding his war stallion, but by riding on a donkey's colt. So this is the conquering, peaceful Jesus. And Jesus says to the folks, don't be afraid. Yes, I'm coming in as king, but I'm coming in to, to conquer you peacefully as you submit to me. That's what John had in his memory but that's not what happened on the Isle of Patmos. On the Isle of Patmos, it wasn't the conquering, fear, uh, peaceful Jesus. On the Isle of Patmos, we read this. 
clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. Only the emperor of Rome could wear the golden sash. Golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is no conquering, peaceful Jesus riding on a donkey. This is the warring Jesus. And yes, John fell flat on his face like he was dead. He didn't run up and hug him and say, Jesus, I haven't seen you physically for five decades. What a delight to see you again before I die. What can I do for you? Jesus came back not as the peaceful, kind, loving. He came back as the warring Messiah who is God. And John falls. But Jesus' words were still the same. Fear not. And the reason we don't fear is because that warring Jesus... He is warring and fighting for you and for me. He's not coming to destroy us. He's coming to destroy the enemy. We don't need to fear him in that sense. We need to proclaim him. We need to honor him and we need to worship him. Who is Jesus? Our next stop. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, if you read your Bible, you do not see the word Trinity in your Bible. Trinity is from Latin anyway, but... but you don't see the word Trinity in the Bible. As Christians, we're Trinitarians. Next week at the library, we've got a massive lecture series going on. And we'll have as a special guest in here for an interview next Sunday, Dr. Fred Sanders, who's one of the church's leading authorities on the Trinity. Teaches at the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, or Biola. And he'll be here and I'll interview him next Sunday. But, and I, by the way, bring your friends, bring your guests, bring anybody who's anybody that you're interested in in your life. It'll be a fascinating opportunity. This guy also draws comic books. He's done a comic book on the, the Trinity. It's kind of cool. But this idea of the Trinity is not expressed in those terms in the Bible. We've got to really wait in church history until about 325 A.D. That was the year of the Council of Nicaea where the doctrine of the Trinity was, was best explained in, in, in terms that the church has continued to embrace and understand. But just because the word was not used in the Bible doesn't mean the Bible did not teach that there is one God who is found in three persons. The Bible taught it, it just did not use our vocabulary and didn't sit down and have a theological dissertation on how that works and why that works and what that means. But you may know the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. We've got folks in here that are old enough to know that, don't we? The young people think that they've got this new hymn that's Holy, Holy, Holy. That's a beautiful thing, but it's left out like, part of the stuff. Bev Bowman, would you come up here and lead us in, in the first verse of this? Do y'all know Bev Bowman? Give her a hand. This is nice of her to do. But it's not like I called her last week and said, hey, I'm going to have you do this. I, I, uh, yeah, let's, let's throw the first verse up there. I've got it. Uh, you know that first verse. 
and y'all have got to sing it, okay? You so ready? everybody sing. This is a Christian a karaoke, all right? Group style. So you're singing with me, all right? Ready? Holy, 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 holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Thank you, Bev. Bev, before you sit down, could you do the Donny Osman thing for us? No. Uh, uh, just the dance. Jesus proclaimed himself divine. We should never listen to folks who say, well, Jesus never technically said he was God. Those folks have not studied their Bible carefully because the Bible makes no mistake. Jesus was not just a carpenter who had a, a, an affiliation preaching for three years before he unfortunately died. Wasn't just a kind fella trying to move people along in love. Jesus was God incarnate. Look at what Jesus says. He says, I am. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the great I am. Now, where does the I am come from? The I am is notable in John because the I am is the words that Jesus, Jesus, that God used from the burning bush. If you go back to the Exodus story where Charlton Heston is on the mountain, <laughs> played by Moses, no, Moses is on the mountain, played by Charlton Heston. If you go back there and you read about it in your Bible, you can read it in Scripture and it's got an interesting passage. I'm in Exodus chapter 3. God tells Moses to head out and to redeem the people and to call them forth. And Moses is concerned. The people at this point have been in Egypt for hundreds of years. The Egyptians have eight gazillion gods. And the people are going to want to know which god it is that's doing all of this. If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, they're going to say, well, who is that? Which one is the God of our fathers? What's his name? And what am I to say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Hundreds of years, 200 plus years before Jesus, Jewish scholars translated that into Greek. And in Greek, it becomes ego, whoops, ego, a me. Ego, a me. Say it. Ego, a me. Harvey Brown took Greek in college. Judge Brown. You remember Amy is an enclitic, so the accent moves over to ego. Anyway, that's just like a freebie y'all get by coming to this class. Um, ego a me, I am. Those are huge words. I am is who spoke to Moses from the burning bush. When Jesus says it in the Greek, ego a me, and John writes it, John does that 11 times in his gospel. John uses ego a me with Jesus more than all the synoptics put together. This is a big deal. I am. Jesus is God. Jesus spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, we think of that like letters of the alphabet because alpha, alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. And that's legitimate. It's, it's the first letter to the last letter. It's A to Z. 
But when you're on the Isle of Patmos, it means something else too. Because the Isle of Patmos are really two to three to four big hills that are kind of joined together. And if you see the land that joins them together, every point on the Isle of Patmos where you're facing inward, you see this. And it's actually shaped like the Greek Alpha and the Greek Omega. The East and the West. Jesus is not just the first letter to the last letter of the alphabet. He's the East and the West. He's the whole picture. He is the first and the last. That makes him Israel's king and redeemer. Those aren't made up words. Oh gee, we need another phrase to make it sound good. Isaiah 44 is what Jesus is referencing there. Look at what Isaiah 44 says. And understand who Jesus is saying he is. Hear, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. I'll pour out my spirit. I'll pour out my blessings. Get the flow of it. In time, I'm skipping to verse 6. Thus says Yahweh, that Lord in all capitals, Yahweh, Thus says Yahweh, the king of Israel, and Israel's redeemer, Yahweh of hosts. Can you all read that? What does it say? Who does Jesus say that he is? When he uses that language, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Jesus is God. Jesus is Israel's king and redeemer. Israel is our king and redeemer as we're grafted into the tree. He's the first and the last. He's the king and redeemer. Who else? Jesus is God. The beginning and the end. Who else has been in the beginning? Who else existed at the beginning? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And who brings it to an end? God. Jesus. The I Am. The Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. There is no other God beside Him. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. You got it? Last stop. Hold on to the heart of the matter. Here's the passage from Revelation 2. I know your works your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Let's pause for a moment. That's a really nice positive statement, isn't it? I know your works, your toil, that's like sweat work. Your patient endurance, that's a godly characteristic. How you can't bear with those who are evil. Paul says in Romans, let your love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Genuine love hates evil. You can't bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. Paul told the church, test the apostles. Test the teachers. When I stand up here and teach you, I'm not an apostle in that sense, but when I stand up here and teach you, you need to weigh what I say. I don't always get it right. I don't have perfect theology. I'm sharing with you from my study. 
as prayerfully I've tried to seek God and what He wants us to discuss and learn together. But you have a responsibility to sit and listen and pray for discernment. That's a good thing. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. you found them to be false. It keeps going. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. That is a good thing. We are called to be patient. Patience is a virtue. To endure patiently for the sake of Jesus and his name, his reputation, who he is, what he's done. This is high praise from the Savior. You've not grown weary, he says. That again, Isaiah, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like the eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. And that, that's, those are good things. They're doing good things. They're doing it right. But I have this against you, he says. You've abandoned the love you had at first. You have abandoned the love you had at first. I want to talk to you about this. You're, you're here, or you're watching this, or you're listening to this on a podcast, or on the radio. Terry Lowry's radio show plays our lessons. You're, you're, you're into this because you care. Maybe it's just a curiosity. Maybe you just stumbled upon it. If so, fine. But you're in this because you care, by and large. I mean, look, you, you got dressed today. You came to church. You put on your makeup. Some of you. You, you care. You're doing the things that we ought to be doing. Hebrews, don't forsake assembling yourselves together. But if all you're doing is checking off the list of things, and you may be teaching in the nursery, and you may be teaching up here, you may be teaching wherever, you're, 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 you're treating people kindly, you're smiling, you didn't grab the last parking place right there, you let someone else do it. You didn't honk at them when they cut you off coming into the parking lot. You're, 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 you're trying to, to be faithful to, to the Lord in what you do. You're faithful to your family, to your spouse, or to your friends, or to your job. You're doing the things you need to be doing as a Christian. Those good works that Paul wrote about in Ephesians 2, that were created in Christ Jesus to do. You're doing those. The church was doing those. But they'd lost the love that they had at first. You can do it out of duty and obligation, but it's not the same as doing it out of love. Pastor Stephen this morning in his sermon read a, a memo about uh, my Greek professor that I had, uh, Dr. Harvey Floyd, an, an uh, an email that was being sent around after Dr. Floyd passed away. One of my favorite Dr. Floyd stories was when Dr. Floyd was visiting some of his students that he had had, and he taught for 50 years at our school. But he was visiting some students in Japan. And those students, um, uh, he went to visit one student and his wife uh, who had uh, gone home to Japan. And when he was finished, Dr. Floyd was finished, Dr. Floyd and his wife Virginia were going to see another student at another town, city. And so they were going to take the train. The student they had visited with took them not only to the train station, but said he was going to ride the train with them to the next city and get them to the next student's house. 
And Dr. Floyd said, you really don't need to do that. We can do this. We can do it. And the student said, no, this is my obligation. And the student did it. Dr. Floyd and his wife, Virginia, visited student number two. They finished that visit, and we're going to go visit student number three. And student number two insisted, likewise, not only to take them to the train station, but to ride the train with them and get them off at the right stop to get them to the house at student number three. Dr. Floyd said, you really don't have to do this. And student number two said, but Dr. Floyd, it is my pleasure. Dr. Floyd said, there is a difference in the way we felt from the student who said, it is my obligation, <laughs> and the student who said, it is my pleasure. I mean, if you don't think there's a difference, if you're married, try it out on your spouse. <laughs> Mark, would you take out the trash? Becky, it would be my obligation. <laughs> it will go over differently than... It would be my pleasure. <laughs> Miss Carolyn, uh, Hank, your wife is clapping on that one. That's a point for you to take home, brother. I this is so important. I love the way different people have said it. There was a Christian rocker in the 60s. His name was Larry Norman. And this is the way he put it into words. You could be a righteous rocker. You could be a holy roller. You could be most anything. You could be a Leon Russell or a super muscle. You could be a corporate king. You could be a wealthy man from Texas or a witch with heavy hexes. But without love, you ain't nothing without love. Without love, you ain't nothing without love. Paul the Apostle said it this way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so I can remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I have gained nothing. Jesus said it this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Quoting Deuteronomy 6.5. Jesus said later, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. John himself wrote Jesus saying, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you're also to love one another. By this all people will know you're my follower. You're my disciple. If you have love for one another. And then just a couple of chapters later, John has Jesus saying, this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has this than no man, or greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Then just a couple of verses later, these things I command you so that you will love one another. All of the things that we do, if they're not proceeding out of a heart of love. Jesus says, I'm really glad you're doing those things. I'm glad you're doing them for me, for my sake and in my name. And I see it and I recognize it. But you, I've got one thing against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Do you know why that love is so deep at first for the Lord? It's what we got this morning from Pastor Stephen in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, Galatians and Ephesians. Here it is. Oh, I'm just... Uh, I, I, there, there are a few times where I've so wished that y'all could read this in the Greek. If you could read this in the Greek, you would be moved to tears. The message is no less weakened by the English translation. But the succinct beauty of it is a little harder to dig into. In the Greek, for by grace 
you have been saved through faith. I got to put the Greek up here. I uh, do not want to rate that right now. We'll rate that later. Got to love the internet. Okay. You're just going to have to work with me here, but you need to see this. We are right here at verse 8. Tegar karati. The gar just means for. Ah, get rid of that stuff. For the grace. For the grace. And that is a noun, as Stephen said. That's the cross of Christ. You picture when you read this. Paul uses charity in a different way than all the other New Testament writers. Except Luke picks up on it some because he was Paul's buddy. But when Paul talks about the charity of God, the gift, he means the cross of Christ. You can take that in your Bible and just draw a cross right there. For by the cross, esti means you are. Now you've memorized, many of you, this verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith. The Greek has this verb, you are. By the grace, by the gift, by the cross of Christ, you are right now, present tense, this moment, you are. And then you've got this says, sosmenoi. Says sosmenoi is a passive you ready for this? This is why you did not take Greek. <laughs> that is a perfect passive participle. Here's what it means. It means in the past, something has already happened to you. That explains why you are what you are at the moment of time in the main verb, which is present tense. So the Greek, when you parse it apart, what he, Paul is saying is, by the cross of Christ, the grace of God, by the cross of Christ, you are right now someone who has already been saved through faith. So that's, I mean, that's amazing. Through our faith in Jesus, we are right now someone who has, past tense, already been saved. As Dr. Floyd said to that dear student, and I've told you before, but it's, it's, these stories bear repeating. The student who said to Dr. Floyd one day, Dr. Floyd, would you tell us about the day you got saved? Dr. Floyd said, took his glasses off and says, oh, I would love to. He said it was almost 2,000 years ago. And he proclaimed the gospel. Because we've already been saved. We had the means of that salvation is through our faith that we are living in the present. And when we realize that this is what he's done. And that he did it out of love. I mean, look, Jesus did not just... G, look, when, when I was a kid, I used to think this. If it was such a big deal, I mean, yes, thank you, God. But if it was such a big deal, why didn't he just do it a different way? If it was such a big deal, why didn't he just say, okay, I'll just forgive him? Well, he can't. God's not going to change who he is and his character is, a, is that of a just God, a consistent God. He can't just say, ah, oh, fine, I don't care about sin. Or yeah, it's a big deal, but I can just wash through it. We'll just take an eraser. No, there is a penalty that has to be paid. That's the reason he was willing to say, I am going to divest myself of this presence that I have as the divine one in glory and in humility I'm going to become one of those things I made. And then once he got here he didn't lord it over us. The Lord did not lord it over us. But he allowed himself to be mistreated, abused, maligned 
by other little creatures. And not even the best of them. I mean, look. He's letting himself be picked on by people. That he could just whoosh. And they'd be gone. And he did all of that because he cares deeply for you and for me. And he knows that without it, there is no ransom, no rescue, no redemption. He's the first and the last. He's the redeemer of Israel. And we are his people by faith. We are the Israel by faith. And he did that out of love. And what we need to always do is keep that in our brain because we need to remember everything we do for him if we've left out the love that we had at first when we first realized this then we're missing it. Stay in love with Jesus. So here are the points for home, your lessons to go. Fear not. I don't care what you've got coming in front of you. I don't care how wacky your boss is. I don't care how disturbed your finances are. I don't care. I'm not saying don't deal with things responsibly, but I'm saying deal with them responsibly, and that begins with prayer and taking them because this is a Jesus who fights for you. He died for you so that love can reign in your life and in your heart. Can I pray over you, please? Father, thank you so much for the chance to proclaim the gospel. With love in our hearts, Father, we stir before you as a people who are unworthy yet loved. And we don't have a lot that we can say in response except thank you. Father, kindle your love in our hearts fresh and anew. May we always come back to your gospel. May we always come back to your grace, to the cross of Christ. To be reminded, to be revived, to be refreshed, to understand again your deep love for us. And Father, may that influence everything we're doing. as we live for you. Through Jesus our Lord, King, I am first and last, Alpha and Omega, Redeemer, King, we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.